Hey, what's up, YouTube? Stevie C, I'm back with some more of my book, Please Don't Die, written by me. And right now we're on Chapter 7, Puppies. Uh, this has been a little while since I've uh, read from this, but you don't know that because I'm just going to probably lay them out like back to back, so forget I said that. <laughs> All right, here we go. Chapter 7, Puppies. If you haven't noticed by now, I should point out that I am writing this book in no particular order as far as any kind of formal timeline goes. When I sit down to write, I write from my heart. I am not any kind of, I'm not any, I am not on any kind of deadline except to take a sip of this beer and maybe regroup that sentence. Uh, start over. Chapter 7, Puppies. If you haven't noticed by now, I should point out that I am writing this book in no particular order as far as any kind of formal timeline goes. When I sit to write, I write from the heart. I am not on any kind of deadline or rush to get this amazing book finished and published. I am in no hurry, and I only choose to write when I am feeling inspired. Unlike many other authors, I write not on a specific schedule, but more so whenever I want and whenever I'm in the mood. I don't force my work or my ideas. I just let them come to me uh, when they come to me, and I let it flow naturally. With that being said, let's talk about puppies. Everybody loves puppies. One of my earliest and most bizarre childhood memories involves two dogs having sex. If you've ever witnessed two dogs going at it, then you know exactly what I mean. It's super weird. When two dogs have sex, they literally get stuck together for a short period of time. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. They start off in the traditional doggy style position, but what strangely ends up happening is that they get stuck together butt to butt and facing away from each other. It is super, super weird, and a phenomenon that I guess I'll never be able to quite wrap my head around. The first time I saw this happen, I was very young, and my dad was at work, so there was really no one to explain to me what the heck was going on. I actually tried separating them physically <laughs> once, and the poor male dog must have been thinking, leave us alone, you little cock blocker, and let us do our thing. <laughs> when dad got home from work, he explained that... Uh, he explained things to me in a little bit more of specific detail. He gave me the kid's version of the birds and the bees, doggy edition. I still thought it was super strange, the whole stuck together part. I mean, seriously, imagine how messed up that would be if that happened to us humans. <laughs> Can you imagine the poor guy walking in on his wife having an affair? Talk about an awkward moment. I'll just let you guys finish up and I'll be back in 15 minutes to kick your ass, pal. <laughs> I'm getting off track here. Uh, what were we talking about again? Oh yes, puppies. Let's talk about puppies. My father was a proud member of the AKC. That's the American Kennel Club. He was breeding dogs and selling them from since before I was even born. I'm not even sure really how he got into it, but when he had a passion, but he did have a passion and love for all animals and especially dogs. He bred toy collies. They were so cute. We would have between 10 and 15 puppies in just one litter. And this was very profitable for my dad. Even back then, such a long time ago, he could easily get 500 bucks for just one puppy. It came with all the shots, paperwork, and genuine camarada satisfaction guarantee. It was so exciting watching the puppies arrive to the world. I remember it so well. One of the jobs that I was tasked with was shredding old newspapers for the puppies' bedding. And to help keep them warm, we would remove the old, soiled... Hold, please. I'm thirsty, that's all. Don't judge me. <laughs> okay. All right, so we would remove the soiled newspapers and clean out the cage and replace them with freshly old ripped newspapers. As I write this, I can still hear the sound of the tearing of the paper, the smells of the cage, and I vividly remember one of the most intriguing and fascinating smells on the planet. You know what I'm going to say. Puppy breath. I just love getting licked by a newborn puppy and the smell of their breath is so unique. The interesting thing about puppy breath is that as far as I'm aware, no matter what the kind of breed of dog is, all puppies have the same breath. Pretty cool. Oftentimes when new puppies were born, there was almost always a tiny little guy who was smaller than the rest and would find it hard to get a nipple and get milk. In some instances, the mom would totally ignore the smallest puppy. It was always sad for me to see this. Dad called the smallest puppy the runt of the litter. It was heartbreaking watching this runt of the litter trying to get noticed and starving for mom's affection and nourishment. 
Even more sadly, the other puppies would totally bully and fight with the smallest puppy. I hated seeing this. I always gravitated towards the runt of the litter and did my best to give them a fighting chance at survival. I would push the other puppies out of the way who already had more than their fair share of precious mother's milk, and I would physically position the small puppy close to the nipple in hopes that it would latch on and receive that much-needed milk. Sadly, for some reason, the mom wouldn't even seem to want the smallest puppy to have milk at all. The situation always bothered me so much, and it was something that I could just never understand or accept. I thought to myself, what if my mother treated me like that? Thankfully for me, my mother was the best and always showed me <clears throat> and my siblings tremendous love. In instances such as this, I would take over and become the mother. With dad's help, I would put warm milk in the eyedropper and feed the runt of the litter myself, one drop at a time, in hopes that it would survive. Sometimes, in addition to doing this, the only way to ensure the little guy's survival was to keep the puppy separated from the rest of the litter until he came became big enough to fend for himself. Survival of, survival of the fittest, I guessed. Taking the runt of the litter under my wing was never an easy task. It was a lot of responsibility for a five-year-old kid such as me, but even at that young age, I knew the alternative was very possibly death. <laughs> uh, nursing the small puppy brought about a special bond and a very emotional connection was always created. My father had often warned me not to get too emotionally attached to the runt of the litter, just in case it didn't make it. Perhaps I wouldn't be so heartbroken if that were to happen. However, the emotional attachment was practically impossible to avoid. One of the saddest days of my life happened to me at such a young age, and it's something I've repressed and buried deep in my subconscious mind. We had one particular litter that was very large. Our dog gave birth to almost 15 puppies. Sadly, one died instantly, but the runt of the litter I became especially fond of. I made it my mission to ensure the survival of this cute little guy. I would feed it every day with the eyedropper and try super hard to encourage the mom to let the puppy latch onto her nipple. I tried to keep the larger bully puppies away and not let them be mean. I would come home from school and immediately run down to the basement to check on him. On one such occasion, I came downstairs to find the puppy dead. <clears throat> the mom had apparently sat on the puppy and suffocated it. I guess I'll never really know if this was done accidentally or intentionally, but it was one of the saddest days of my entire life. I cried so loudly that my dad came rushing down the stairs, thinking that maybe I hurt myself or something. He took the cold, lifeless puppy from my trembling hands, and I clearly remember him wrapping it up in a newspaper and telling me to go upstairs and put it in the garbage. That's a really weird thing. I remember my dad saying that. At the time, it seemed like a reasonable request and the only thing really to do. But as I grew older and reflected on that very sad moment, many times I've wondered why my dad wouldn't choose to bury the puppy in the yard and say a prayer or something. This next thing I'll tell you I was actually thinking of omitting from this book. But it's something I've held on to in the back of my mind for so many years that perhaps if I just come out and say it, I can finally release the horrible memory. My dad handed me the dead puppy wrapped in a newspaper and I cried as I climbed the stairs to the kitchen to place it in the garbage as my dad had instructed. I remember so vividly what happened next. The garbage was full to the top and when I placed the small package inside the garbage can, I remember having to press down firmly to compact the trash, and in doing so, I distinctly remember hearing and feeling the tiny little bones of the dead puppy break beneath the pressure. It was seriously one of the most tragic moments of my life, and something that I've always tried so hard to forget, but with not much success. I would most certainly say that sadness overall played a very small role in the breeding of puppies. Except for the events described above, and for the most part, growing up with a father who breeded dogs brought about great joy. Also, there was the financial aspects to consider. My dad lived his entire life to provide for his family, and he always selflessly put our needs before his. The occasional revenue stream from dad being a member of the AKC helped our family out in many ways, and not only got us through some potentially tough times, but would often give my parents the extra income available to be able to go on family vacations to Florida and Disneyland. All the memories 
all in all, the memories I have of raising puppies is most definitely a positive one. Thank you so much. That is chapter seven, puppies.